business, his fishing business behind. He just sold out wall to wall and began to follow Christ. He, he confessed Christ. It was Simon Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who, who said, you are the Christ, the Son of, of the living God. And Jesus said, that's exactly right, Simon Peter, and this is the rock, this confession. You are the rock, this confession upon which I will build my church. I, I've often thought that the disciples often snickered when Jesus called Simon the rock, Peter, because they knew his tendencies. They knew his up and down. He could be impetuous and temptuous, and, and he could be a hothead at times. And yet, this man walked with Jesus, and he heard his teachings. He, 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 he looked into his eyes. He camped out with him and fished with him and even walked on water with Jesus. He, he was allowed, when Jesus pulled back the veil of eternity to look into his glory, to see Moses and Elijah standing with Christ in all of his glory on the mount uh, known as Transfiguration. This, these are some of the adventures of Simon Peter as he, as he walked with the Lord Jesus. And I believe, there's no doubt in my mind, that Simon loved the Lord. He believed in the Lord. And yet he failed so miserably when he denied and discredited and dishonored the Lord. How on earth could this happen? What actually happened? Well, let's read it in Luke chapter 22. And we're going to pick up our reading first in verse 31. This is around the table of the Lord. That last supper, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you even know me. And then after Jesus was arrested, betrayed by Judas Iscariot, Peter finds himself following at a distance, and in verse 54, here's what we read. Here's what happened. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest. And Peter was following at a distance. Underline that in your Bible. Peter was following at a distance. We see the dual nature of Peter in that verse. He wanted to get close. He wanted to be close or as close as possible, and yet... He wasn't close enough to the Lord. When the Lord needed him the most, he found himself at a distance from the Lord. Maybe you find yourself at a distance from the Lord today. You, you have chosen to follow from afar. Maybe you even walked into this room and you're kind of sitting at a distance today because you don't want to get too close. Maybe you show up at church wondering what's going on, but when the worship of the Lord is on, you, you don't worship, you don't sing. When the offering plate is passed for believers to give, you keep your hands in your pocket. When the Word of God is opened, you have not much interest. There was a time when you walked closely with the Lord, you were near and He was dear to you, but, but now over time, you've left your first love. And like Peter, you find yourself at a distance. And when you are at a distance, you are vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. And notice, therefore, what happened to Peter. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, just a little girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was also with him. He was with Jesus. Verse 57, 
but he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. How many times does that, how many times has he denied the Lord? Say one time. One time. Verse 58. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. How many times is that? That would be two. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man who was with him, this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. How many times would that be? Three times, as our Lord predicted. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. The other gospel writers include the fact that he swore with an oath. He lies, he denies. He profanely swears that he never even knew Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine that look? In that moment, after one, two, three times, Peter denied the Lord. The Lord was brought out, and their eyes locked. And just as Jesus had predicted, his man, the big fisherman, so often bold and courageous, powerful, persuasive, fails. And he knew and remembered, verse 61, saying what the Lord said, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And read that out loud with me. And he went out and wept bitterly, broken by his fall. It just tears him apart. When we fail, and we do fail, none of this is a surprise to the Lord. None of it. Jesus wasn't surprised that Peter failed. He predicted it. He prophesied it. But in this message, you're going to learn how you can fail forward. You, you, can't, you can't really make time go forward. You can change the clock. You know, by my, by my time, I'm still on the old time. I've got another hour to preach. <laughs> Not really. Relax. You can't change the clock. You can't really change time. I guarantee you, if you go by the rooster, you know when the sun's coming up, whether the clock has changed, whatever the the clock says. But you, you, you can't turn time back. You really can't turn time forward. But when you fail, rather than falling back into the past of defeat and living there in shame and regrets for the rest of your days, you can fall forward into the grace of God. People want to know, can you lose your salvation? Can you fall out of grace? I never read in the Bible about anyone who falls out of grace. When I read my Bible, I read of scores of people who have fallen into grace into the arms of Christ, into the power of a brand new life. And when that rooster crowed, yes, it was, a, it, was a, it was a sign, it was a signal of Peter's failure, but it was also a signal and a reassurance that God was in control. And for Peter, it would be the dawning of a new day, a brand new day. Well, that's what this message is about. But before we talk about failing forward, we we need to say a little bit about why we fail, why we sin when we sin, why we do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. Now remember I said many of these steps and missteps are are subtle and, and maybe even small. We get ourselves in an area of vulnerability and compromise. We all have certain tendencies and weaknesses in our lives that 
most of the time we know about. And, and in this case, Simon Peter gave the devil a stick to hit him with and he hit him hard. In the case of Peter, this catastrophic collapse when he denied, when he lied and denied, swore that he even knew him, it was momentary and temporary. And what we need to do when we see someone fail, rather than judge them and stone them, we need to not mistake the moment for the man. What happens in a moment does not make a man. Certainly our choices over time form our character. We've said that many times. But if I didn't believe a person could be changed by the power of Jesus Christ, restored and made brand new, as we sang a moment ago, our sins washed whiter than snow, I would fold this Bible and never speak again from this pulpit. I believe so strongly that anyone who has failed Anyone who's living with regrets and failure can live again and love Christ again. Now there's some steps to, to our failures. And so let this be, at the outset, a warning. First of all, in Luke 22, verse 31, if you look at it again, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Now, can you imagine hearing this from Jesus? Simon, my man, you're a target of the devil. Now, the you there is plural, so it certainly could have included everyone in the group who would face the attacks of the enemy when Christ was arrested. But the fact is, Simon Peter was especially under attack. How scared would you be if the devil himself was personally calling you out? I'd be pretty scared. Peter would later write, First, in, in, in 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He was speaking from experience because the hot breath of Satan was on his neck. And Satan had him in his target line. But Jesus promised to pray for Peter that his faith would not fail. He would fail. But his faith would not fail. He would fail forward. That he would become a better man, a more devoted disciple. That the prayers of Jesus would, would propel him into a future greater than his sin. Romans 8.34 says this about the prayers of Jesus for you. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding. Interceding means praying, praying for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? This is a promise that no matter what attack you may face in your life, the God of the universe, the one at the very throne of the universe is praying for you and has promised, if you belong to him, that you will be kept in the power of his love. You have to scratch your head and wonder, why did Satan get permission to ambush Peter? Why would God allow Peter to be attacked like this. Satan had to ask permission. Satan is not running around doing whatever he wants to do. Anything Satan does, it is in the permissible will of God. So Satan asked for Simon Peter. Remember that happened in the Old Testament when, when Satan asked God for Job. 
And so he asked, so why? Because Simon Peter was a mighty instrument in the hand of God. And the devil loves a shining mark. You know, he may send demons after most of us. But Satan is especially interested in the man or the woman who is being greatly used of God. This is one reason that, that Satan attacks Christian leaders today. And it's the reason that we should always pray for people in spiritual leadership. Pray for me, your pastor. Pray for our ministers. Pray for Jared, our teaching pastor, our campus. Pray for the men and women who, who lead our church. If God is using something, all hell is interesting. Someone or something, I tell you, God is, uh, Satan is interested in bringing that down. We've been through an experience with our church a number of years ago when, when, when Satan tried to bring this church down. But God's people prayed. God had a plan beyond the attacks of the enemy. We know that we're in the hands of God, but we're strengthened by the prayers of one another. And, and oh, by the way, not just spiritual leaders, not just people on platforms, but if you are committed to following Christ and sharing your faith as a bold witness of Christ, Satan is interested in that, and you also are a potential target of the enemy. So we need to pray for one another, don't we? And be strengthened in our prayers for each other. We know that Jesus is praying for us and with us. Let's join him in that prayer. That our faith fail not. And now having said that, Peter did fail just as as Jesus predicted. And here's how it happened. There are three steps downward that I want to show you. One is pride. Just pure old pride, as old as the devil himself. Back when we read the the prophecy of Jesus that Peter would deny the Lord, what did Peter say? Not me. He begins arguing with the Lord. We're told in the Gospels that he even said, all these others may deny you. But not me. I'm better than that. I'm stronger than that. You see what is happening here? He boasted of his own commitment. He's debating Jesus. Lord, everyone else may fail you, but I will never fail you. You know me. I'm your guy. He was proud. And his pride led him to overconfidence and self-reliance. He's doing what many of us do, and that is to trust in self and our self-sufficiency rather than to depend completely upon the Lord. Look, look up here, listen to me. Don't ever say, don't ever say, I would never commit that sin. I would never do that. I would never fail at this point. Don't you say that. The Apostle Paul said, let him who stands take heed, pay attention, lest you fall. Better men than me and you have failed and fallen the Lord, including Simon Peter. So don't get arrogant and say, oh, I'm, I'm really walking with the Lord now. I've got it together. I I would never fail the Lord like this. Peter was so full of himself. Left to ourselves, there is no sin that we would not commit. Given the right set of circumstances, if we are following the Lord at a distance, there's no sin, no failure that is out of bounds. In fact, you know, Peter's failure was really at the point of his strength. But what would you say was the strength of Simon Peter? I would say it was his boldness, his courage, his commitment. Guy you could count on to, to step up and say it. 
He was strong at the point of his courage. So Satan not only attacks us at our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, learn something on this, but at the point of our strengths. We see that all through the Bible. What, what was Abraham's strength? We, if you watch the Bible, the series on Abraham, I would say, and, and the Bible certainly tells us that his, his strength was in his faith. He was a man of great faith. God chose him. And yet, we're told that Abraham, and on one occasion, lied about his own wife, said his wife was his sister to save his own neck. And on other occasions, he showed incredible failures of faith. Again, not at the point of weakness, but the point of strength. What about, what about King David? What would you say is the strength of King David? Well, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. He was the shepherd boy of Israel. He had a heart to worship. He, he was a man of integrity. I would say David's strength was his integrity. And yet Satan attacked him at the point of his integrity and he committed adultery and ultimately set up the murder of the woman's husband and failed the Lord miserably. Moses. I, there are many characteristics of Moses. He, one was his wisdom. Another was his meekness. The scripture says that he was the meekest man who ever lived. That means strength under control, meekness. Man under control. And yet what was his great weakness in his life? Often he would lose control even when he was a young man and he, and he chose to defend the Israelites. He, he took the life of another man in, 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 a, in a hurry and then hit him and spent the next 40 years of his life on the backside of a desert paying for his failure. But Satan attacked him at the point of his strength, not his weakness. I memorized something from Oswald Chambers, the great devotional writer, many years ago that I, I constantly remind myself. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. Write that in the little white part of your Bible at the back. That's a good one. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. And often we become reliant, self-reliant upon our strengths, and it is in, the, in our strength or our self-sufficiency that we lose it all. We're all just one big bad mistake from spiritual collapse and failure. So don't brag about your bold faith. Don't, don't be talking about your great love for God. If you're going to brag, you brag on God's great love for you. If you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. Peter was boasting. And his pride put him under. Secondly, prayerlessness. Remember back in the garden, Gethsemane, when Jesus got Peter, James, and John to go with him a little farther, and when he prayed, when all hell was about to break loose, he said, pray with me. What happened? Peter and those men fell asleep. And it wasn't even time change Sunday. They were exhausted. We're told they fell asleep for, uh, they were so sorrowful. So they, they fell asleep for sorrow, which I take to mean simply they cried themselves to sleep. But they slept. And as a result, while he, Jesus had told Peter and the rest of them, pray here so that you don't enter into temptation. It wasn't even that Jesus, Jesus needed their prayers. They needed their prayers. They needed to be strengthened in the face of the darkness that was encroaching. But they didn't pray. And let me tell you that this is a danger that we all face. Prayerlessness. We tend to pray 
when, when we know we're helpless and hopeless, but so often we're prayerless day to day, and then when the enemy attacks, we're not ready for the attack. Jesus taught us to pray in the model prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is to be a kind of daily devotion, a, a, a prayer, the Jesus way to pray day to day. And, and we're to pray for protection, uh, we're, we're, lest we face temptation, and we do. Look, you, me, none of us are any stronger than our prayer lives. And by that I mean every failure in my life, I can point to every failure in my life, and it was a prayer failure. When we don't pray, Jesus said, pray that you do not faint or fall out. So, it's really a short answer. Pray and fall out, or don't pray rather and fall out, or pray and persevere. But prayer is such a powerful force in our lives, strengthening our souls, stealing our souls. And prayer puts me on my knees, on my face before God where I'm not depending upon myself. I, there in the, in, the, in the presence of God, I realize I can't do this on my own. I can't handle this. That's prayer. Prayer produces power from God and expresses our trust and faith in Him. But prayerlessness, you see, pride leads to prayerlessness. So then prayerlessness leads to pressure. And that's the third thing that we see. When, when Jesus was arrested, the, the disciples fled. Uh, the fear was just too much, and they, they ran away. And, and this crowd, people who were awake, uh, began to gather around for this trial, this, this unjust injustice that was about to take place. So Peter decided, you know, to follow at a distance. Now he's still o- overconfident. He said, I'll I'll get close. So he came as close as I can without really getting in this thing. And he said he followed at a great distance. And then he slowly worked his way into, through the crowd and outside in the courtyard where Jesus was was facing the last night of his life. And and he's warming his fire, uh, hands by the fires of the enemy. He's out there where he shouldn't be with the enemies of Christ. First, he's, he's walking with the crowd and, and, and then he's sitting with the crowd, and then he's in the crowd. Walking, standing, and sitting. He just flung himself into the face of temptation. And the pressure was too much. When we go to Israel, we, we go to the place Uh, where that happened, as I showed you a moment ago. And I've stood there and imagined myself under the same conditions with the enemies of Christ around me and the fires of Satan burning. What would I have done? Psalm 1, 1 tells us that the man, the woman of God, does not walk or stand or sit in the counsel, in the presence of the ungodly. That he was in the wrong place with the wrong people. The Bible says abstain from every appearance of evil. The road to failure is well populated and the pressure and the heat is on. The scripture says a companion of fools will be destroyed. And if you start pridefully at a distance running from Christ and get into the wrong crowd, you're on the verge of spiritual collapse. I've seen it over and over again. Well, that's exactly what happened. Peter collapsed. He denied the Lord. He wept bitterly when Jesus looked at him. He lost his testimony for Christ like many of us have done when we have denied or dishonored or discredited the Lord in some way. All right, let's wrap this up. We can all think of ways that we have denied the Lord or dishonored him or discredited him in some way. 
And some of you this morning are thinking, I've gone too far over the edge. I can never come back. I failed the Lord not once, but twice and three times and more. There's no help for me. There's no hope for me. I'm, I'm destined and doomed to live the rest of my life regretting what I did. I denied my faith. I discredited my Lord. I dishonored my family, disputed my church. I failed. But that night when Jesus looked at Simon Peter, don't tell me that it wasn't a look of love. Their eyes locked. And while Peter burst into tears, the Lord had compassion upon him. How do we know that? Because Jesus would go to a cross for men and women like Simon Peter. Why? Because he loves us, every one of us. And he would pour out his blood on that cross so that we could be forgiven of all our flaws, failures, sins, and shame. And when that rooster crowed that morning, early on Friday morning, though it broke his heart, Simon Peter's heart and Jesus' heart, that this had happened. It was a reminder, a reassurance that God was in control. He predicted it. He he said exactly what was going to happen. But Jesus said something else to Simon Peter when he said, you'll deny me. He said, but you will rise again to strengthen the brethren. And guess what happened? Simon Peter was restored by Jesus himself after the resurrection. He went on to be the bold and powerful preacher on the day of Pentecost when thousands came to Christ. He became the powerful leader of the church in the first century. He, along with the apostle Paul, God used. journey to the empty tomb, uh, we come to the cross. We're going to spend the next six weeks at the cross and hear the heart of God. God speaking, Jesus, the Son of God, in his statements from the cross, these cries that Christ offers from uh, this altar of sacrifice that we may know who he is and who God is. There are various times in which Jesus tells us who he is, or others tell us who Jesus is, whether it was announcements of his birth by angels, uh, whether at the miracles of Jesus when people confessed him at the Son of God. No one ever spoke like Jesus, and so the great words of Christ penetrating uh, people's hearts, declaring him, demonstrating that he is the Son of God and God the Son. Uh, when Peter responded to Jesus' question, who do men say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven, the spirit of God has revealed this to you. And so throughout the gospels, throughout the word of God, we are told who Jesus is and therefore what God is like because Jesus the Son has come to tell us who the Father is and what he is like and how we can know him. But it comes into the sharpest of all focus in that Jesus at the cross declares who he is and how we can know God. We know who God is and what God is like. And we see the heart of God most powerfully in the life and the words of Jesus at the cross. At the cross, where the innocent one is dying among the transgressors and between two thieves. We've never seen a crucifixion except on film. We've never seen a public execution, much less a cruel crucifixion. 
But a crucifixion was the most shameful and disgraceful death of all. It was devised and adapted by the Romans as a public display of their power to crush resistance, to deter crime. And so crucifixion was, was common in the day of Christ. And particular, uh, Jews were crucified over and over again. And Jesus was led to a cruel death on the cross, not dying for his own crimes, but for the crimes of others. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Death on a cross was torturous. It was brutal and agonizing. A, a, a man would literally suffocate in his own fluids, dying on a cross, or else die from exposure or the loss of blood. Crucifixion was intended to prolong death as long as possible so that ultimately a man would beg to die. Death would become a delight for someone dying on a cross. But on this cross, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see one who is in charge of his own destiny. Even though he was placed into the hands of sinful men, yet Jesus, the Son of God, is in control of all that goes on around him. At the cross, there were mockers and scoffers. The Romans themselves who crucified him, who viewed him as a failed king, just another uprising among the Jews, just another Jew to put on a cross. Around the cross, at the cross, where the religious leaders, the religious establishment who uh, talked together and conspired together to condemn Jesus to death, ultimately at the hands of the Romans. And then there was the curious crowd, the indifferent who just came by to see the latest crucifixion on their way to somewhere, and then they gathered and they watched him there. Of course, there were a few friends and family members at the cross, but ultimately the cross at the cross, we focus on the one who is on that cross. Who is this one dying on the cross? We never see who he is and what he is like more clearly than in the first words spoken by Jesus. The first of these seven statements that he makes upon the cross. Luke 23, 33, and 34. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Here we see the heart of God to give love and mercy, grace, forgiveness. Jesus is telling us from the cross why he came and what he can do for all, and that is to forgive. Jesus came to forgive our sins, to save people from their sins, to save people who are far far from God, including those who even tortured and put him on the cross. He announces his forgiveness that he was dying to give. Here is one who died like no other. He did not die in his sin, but he died for sin. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did not die because of his own sin, but because of the sins of others, yours and mine. And so when he exclaims, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they do. This is Jesus with his arms open wide saying, I love you and I will forgive you if you come to me at the cross. It is written in a way that suggests 
that he repeated these words again and again. Jesus apparently said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Throughout his experience on the cross, his death and dying on the cross, when they nailed him and impaled him on the cross, dropped him in that jagged hole, he was crying out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When they mocked him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When they spit upon him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have said, Father, condemn them. He could have called 10,000 angels to deliver him. But rather than saying, Father, condemn them, he said, Father, forgive them. What amazing love. J.C. Ryle said this, as soon as the blood of the great sacrifice began to flow, the great high priest began to intercede. Jesus is the great high priest who is praying for us then and now. Somehow, Jesus found strength and courage to pray at the cross. As I told you, death on a cross was so torturous and you would die because of asphyxiation, you would suffocate. So it was almost impossible to breathe. So you you could somehow lift yourself up if there was a little pedestal there. And remember I said the Romans wanted you to linger as long as possible and to die as painful and anguishing a death as possible. Some would last for multiple hours, even days on a cross, but you could somehow lift yourself up on this little pedestal and get air in in order to speak. And somehow Jesus was able along the cross's terrible way to speak at his first words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do reminds us that prayer is always possible for the believer and follower of Jesus because we have a God and a Father who cares about us. And in severe crosses and extreme losses. Sometimes we feel, God, are you there? I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. But remember Jesus who prayed for forgiveness to all who would come to him. And no matter what you're facing in your life, no matter how difficult the pain and the anguish in your life, If you can barely breathe, if you can't even speak, you can cry out to God and he will hear you. Pray no matter what. Pray as long as you live. Pray on the last day of your life. We ask, for whom was Jesus praying? For whom was Jesus praying when it says, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they do. What does that mean? Well, he was certainly praying for the soldiers. He was certainly praying for the religious establishment, those who crucified him, the the immediate surrounding uh, persecutors. He he prayed for them. He said, they do not know what they do. Those who crucified Jesus in arrogance, and those who crucified Jesus in ignorance. Some said, we will not have this man to reign over us. They crucified him in arrogance. But they crucified the the Lord of glory because they didn't know what they were doing. They could have never understood the enormity of their sin and the consequences of their sin. They could have never imagined 
what they were doing in crucifying Jesus. They didn't know, some didn't know who he was. They should have known who he was. He told them who he was. As he stood on trial, as he stood before men, he clearly announced his deity, his sonship. They should have known, but they refused to believe. They were blinded by their sin, just like people today who are blinded to the truth and the reality of who Jesus Christ is. They choose their sin over the Savior. Ignorance is no excuse. The other day I was driving to the church and I came a a back way that I normally don't travel. And uh, I'm going down a thoroughfare and, and, and I was driving the speed limit, 45 miles an hour in this particular area. And then I took a turn to get to the church and what I did not realize and did not see that there are a couple of signs on the little side road where I was cutting through that took the, took the uh, uh, speed limit from 45 to 30. I found out that it was a 30 mile speed limit when I got pulled over by a nice officer and he asked me, sir, I mean, you know you're getting a lot older when the policemen look like they're about 16 and call you sir, right? But he said, sir, uh, wh- why, is there any reason you were driving so fast? I don't know why they asked that question. I, I know better than to give an excuse, all right? So I just said, no, sir, I just, uh, I just wasn't paying attention to the speed limit. I was still driving 45, but I was over the speed limit. So I got a nice ticket just to remember what the speed limit is at that particular place. I didn't know. I, I, I thought I was innocent, but I was guilty. And ignorance didn't save me from the consequences of my actions. So when it comes to the cross, we cannot plead ignorance. We didn't know. And yet, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. We see his amazing grace and desire to forgive all, even those who crucified him. Jesus is interceding and he is inviting all to receive his forgiveness. He will forgive anyone, anyone who repents of sin and receives his grace. He gives hope for every poor, undeserving sinner. So when he prays, Father, forgive them, who is the them? We is the them. In that personal pronoun, it is a blessed pronoun. Them means you, me, we can be forgiven of every sin. Do you not think if Jesus would pray to forgive those who committed this unconscionable act of defiance and rebellion and brutality against him. Do you not think that if he would choose to forgive them, that he would choose to forgive you? Hear his prayer, receive his pardon. This is the last invitation of the Bible. Whosoever will may come. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. These words echo through the generations. Thunders in our souls today. Did God the Father answer this prayer? Yes. And he's still answering it today. Are you feeling strong in your walk with Jesus? Or does your faith feel less like a relationship and more like a list of rules to follow? Do you sometimes wonder if God is really there at all? 
These doubts typically rise on difficult days. I know I've experienced my share of tough times, and I know you have too. So today, I want to encourage you by sending you two of my books, God's Promises for Doubt-Filled Days and New Life in Christ. It's our way of thanking you for your gift today to help PowerPoint proclaim the gospel. Get your copies today to discover the unshakable promises God makes to you in the midst of your doubts and the joy of salvation that comes through a living relationship with the lover of your soul, Jesus Christ. So call the number on the screen or visit us online at jackram.org to donate to our ministry and receive God's promises for doubt-filled days and new life in Christ. One of the thieves that we'll talk about next week, as Jesus spoke and interacted with these two thieves, crucified one on the right, one on the left, one of the thieves believed, and I can't help uh, but think that what what drew this thief to Jesus, the dying believing thief, was, was hearing these words, Father, forgive them. A guilty man who knew he deserved to die, he hears Jesus praying to the Father to forgive he said, I want to be forgiven. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. When it was all said and done and Jesus died and committed his spirit to the Father, a hardened Roman soldier had never seen a man die like this one had died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. It must have been the mercy of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus that would forgive that man before he even asked that brought him to confession and declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. And yes, God is still answering that prayer of Jesus today. In fact, did you know that Jesus is still praying? Not on a cross, but at the throne of God. For Hebrews 7.25 says, he always lives to make intercession for them. So he died interceding for us, and he lives interceding for us. He is praying for our forgiveness. The, the portrait here is of, a, of a, a defense attorney standing before the bar, standing in our defense at the judgment bar, interceding for us, interacting with us, praying and pleading for us that we would be forgiven. What a prayer. To God the Father who freely forgives all who receive his Son. Jesus is praying on this altar of sacrifice, bearing our sins, and he's pleading his own blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. His death secures the promise of forgiveness. Forgiveness is free, but it costs God his only Son. Forgiveness is not cheap. The consequences of sin is death, but Jesus paid a debt, the debt that we owed in order that we might be forgiven. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if you have received his forgiveness and mercy, then there's only one thing that you can do having repented of your own sin and received God's grace and mercy by trusting in His Son and Jesus only to be your Lord and Savior, there's only one thing for us to do, and that is to forgive others, to live a life of forgiveness because those who have been forgiven forgive. My friend Erwin Lutzer says, you know, forgiveness is a marvelous idea 
unless you're the one who has to do it. All of us have been hurt and damaged by people. Sinned against and broken by other sin. Perhaps you're thinking there is no way that I can forgive because of this or him or her or this. You probably know by now, if you know me, that I had to deal with that question as a young man when my father was brutally murdered. I had to decide if I was going to live in bitterness or live in forgiveness. And we all do. You say, I can. Yes, by God's grace, you can. And I stand as a testimony to say it's true that God will give us the grace and his love to forgive others. This is at the heart of the cross. We talk about picking up the cross and following Jesus. I can think of nothing more centered in the cross than forgiveness. If you're carrying the cross, Now take your Bibles and turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter four. Nehemiah is a hero. Uh, He is a hero in fact, because he is a patriot. Not because he was a prophet, he was not a prophet. He was not a preacher per se, but he was a man that God called from a life of luxury and contentment with a high level job with the king in Persia to, to serve his homeland and to lead the children of God, the people of God, Israel, in rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem and more importantly, rebuilding their lives. And our reading begins in verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them, that is the opponents, the enemy. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And watch this, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each one to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah and were building on the wall. And those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon, watch this, and held his weapon with the other hand. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. And the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. And in the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So today's message is a rally cry to fight for your family because our families are under attack. We know that. The walls, in effect, representing the glory of God, representing God's protection as well as God's praises around surrounding the people of Israel. The walls were down in that day physically, but spiritually the walls are down today. The walls of family life, domestic tranquility, down. The walls of 
personal morality and security down. Our families are struggling and so many are defeated and living in the brokenness of broken lives, broken walls. A nation is only as strong as its families. A nation is only as strong as your family. A broken family results in a broken culture, a collapsing culture. And that's what we're seeing today. Back in the 1960s, Billy Graham wrote a book called World of Flame. I devoured that book as a teenager. And I pulled out a quote from that book 50 years ago. And yet, how appropriate, apropos are these words today and then some. Here's what Billy said, the immutable law of sowing and reaping has held sway. We are now the hapless possessors of moral depravity and we seek in vain for a cure. The tares of indulgence have overgrown the wheat of moral restraint. Our homes have suffered. Divorce has grown to epidemic proportions. When the morals of society are upset, the family is the first to suffer. The home is the basic unit of our society and a nation is only as strong as her homes. The breaking up of a home does not often make headlines, but it eats like termites at the structure of the nation. So the walls are down. And we need men and women like Nehemiah to stand in the gap for our nation, to leave comfort and security and even safety behind in order to fulfill God's call upon our lives. I want to talk to you about that today. And right here in the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, there is a battle cry and a battle plan to help us fight for our families and our generation. And the first thing that I want to show you is that we are to prepare for opposition, prepare and expect enemies to come, and that includes criticism, and it includes persecution, and everything in between. Again, half the wall is completed. It's often a critical time when half the job is done, when half the race is run, when half the marriage has been accomplished, when half of the child raising is done. And you think, I'm just halfway there. Am I ever going to get it done? So they were in a precarious position to build this wall, halfway home, halfway done when these enemies come. There were great victories already accomplished. The task was being accomplished. But when God opens the windows of heaven to bless us, Satan opens the windows, the doors of hell to blast us. And that's what happens here. And there are some opponents that show up. They were more than opponents. They were enemies. And in verse 1, one of them is named Sanballat. Another is Tobiah. But When Sanballat heard they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. There is so much hate today regarding biblical values, conservative values, family values, not just opposition, but sheer anger and hate that is being unleashed against those who practice biblical morality and spiritual biblical values. And Of course, this is representative, sand ballot is just a tool in the hand, a pawn in the hand of Satan. We're all engaged in a spiritual battle. Life isn't a playground, it's a battleground for the Christian. Every one of us should be engaged in this battle. Satan is real, he's not down in hell shoveling coal. He's loose like a mighty powerful lion on the earth seeking whom he may devour. He has with him a host from hell, an army of terrorists known as demons that are wrecking